but we need to create a permanent federal institution uh, that would be charged with the task of devising and implementing and financing a coherent strategy of sort of economic restructuring, making sure that our U.S. economy is structured in a way that actually has a future and that it we actually work toward making our economy more resilient in the face of be it pandemics, be it climate change, be it whatever kind of shocks we experience, that we have uh, resources that we can mobilize and uh, reapportion in the way we need it. Hello and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. Coming to you today, as always, every week from the quarantine closet where we uh, produce Why Is This Happening at this point with the uh, assistance of uh, Kate Shaw, who is now, I have to credit as a producer, who's also anchor producing me on the show uh, and and helping with the podcast as well. Uh, that would be my wife and also co-host of the Strict Scrutiny podcast, which you should check out. And of course, Tiffany Champion remotely uh, managing all of this. Uh, we are, uh, we've been doing, you know, sort of coronavirus related podcasts podcast conversations, but not sort of squarely uh, repeating the same stuff we're doing on the show. And today's another example of that in that I've been very curious about how we should be thinking about the relationship between financial regulation, the Federal Reserve, the federal government, and businesses amidst this period of insane economic distress and also completely unprecedented measures to kind of keep the economy rescued. And one of the problems that that comes up to me here is sort of there's two issues. There's scale questions and there's equity questions, right? So the scale questions are, are we doing enough to keep the economy from dying while we essentially put it into a medically induced coma through the shelter in place and social distancing that we're all doing. So that's a scale question. And then there's an equity question, which is like, is are we doing this in a just way? Are we doing this in a way in which the ma and pop noodle shop or laundromat uh, is getting as good a break and a chance to stay alive as a Fortune 500 company? Are we putting the same strings attached to them? Are we um, equitably allowing capital to flow to these different sized uh, corporations? And I think that right now, I think the, the the second question is clearly answered in the negative which is that it hasn't been a particularly just uh, response thus far. And I think the first question is probably answer the negative too, which is the scale is not big enough. And so in both of those cases, we're failing. And it's also worth noting that what, we, what we're trying to do now, which is in the midst of the crisis, we, we tried to do a version of back in 2008 and 2009 under different crisis situations. But there's good reason to think that we should think about this in a more permanent institutional sense. And so my, my guest today is someone who has uh, thought about this, has thought about it as, a, as an academic and also somewhat as a practitioner. She was in the U.S. Department of Treasury from 2006 to 2007. She was a special advisor for regulatory policy to the Undersecretary for Domestic Finance. And she's now a law professor at Cornell University, where she specializes in financial sector regulation, the broader issue of finance and economy. And she's been writing about an idea for creating an institution or institutions to oversee this kind of national investment uh, that would do it more equitably. Her name is Saule Omarova, Professor Cornell University. It's great to have her on the program. Sally, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris, for having me here. It's my pleasure. Can you uh, just tell me a little bit about yourself? You were, I, I was looking at your, at your CV and you are, uh, you went to high school in Moscow, is that correct? No, I went to high school in a small, tiny Kazakh provincial town on the okay. outskirts of the Soviet Empire. Um, I'm originally from Kazakhstan. I went to Moscow State University for my undergrad. Oh, your undergrad. I'm sorry. I, I take that right. So you, so you were from Kazakhstan yep. and you went to Moscow State University for an undergrad. So, Professor, tell me why, why did you, why did you come to the U.S.? Well, it was actually pure, um, you know, chance in a way. I was a graduate, an undergraduate student at Moscow State University, and there was, at the very end of the Gorbachev era, an exchange program between Moscow State and University of Wisconsin Madison. And I got lucky against all odds, and I came for that one semester in 1991 to Madison, Wisconsin. And while I was there in December of 1991, the Soviet Union fell apart. And so there I was, a student without anywhere to go back. 
And, um, you know, I was, I was very worried about what was going to happen. And so I stayed and to do my PhD in political science. But, you know, frankly, I'm just, uh, to this day, I kind of feel guilty for having left the country at such a momentous time, because obviously they couldn't hold it together without me. <laughs> your, your departure, that all falls apart. And that, that's amazing timing. So you stay and you do a, you do a PhD in political science. Right. What, what is your area of, of focus in, in, that, in that area of study? Actually, I did comparative political economy and studied the politics of oil development in uh, post-Soviet Russia and post-Soviet Kazakhstan. And then you went on for a law degree. Yes, I did. I've decided that um, I really wanted to have a marketable skill, you know, something real. And so I decided to leave academia and went to Northwestern University uh, to get my JD and then practiced law in New York City for a while and again purely by chance stumbled upon banking law and financial regulation as the area of practice and you know i got lucky i really love that area of practice and so um that's how i became a lawyer and and then you worked you were in the treasury department um, right. for for a few years in the bush administration tell me about what you are what you're working on right now what 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 sort of problem you're dealing with right now um my entire academic career has been centered around this issue of uh, how to ensure uh, that our financial system is stable, effective, and efficient. And so that implicates a lot of questions. Uh, and the more, uh, the, the deeper I dig into the financial system and financial regulation, the more I realize that what it really is about is the social function of finance. Do we have the financial system that is basically serving the needs of the real economy, serving the needs of the American people as it should? Or do we have a financial system that is essentially overbloated, self-referential, self-serving and focused more on speculative investment kind of activity? And so um, that problem uh, kind of permeates all of my scholarship and it keeps coming up in a variety of guises, in a variety of contexts. So, um, you know, throughout my academic career, I looked at a variety of issues, for example, derivatives markets, why is the big bank institutions are allowed to play in essentially gambling type derivatives markets. Then I looked at uh, big banks getting into physical commodity trading, like oil and gas and metals trading, and what kind of stability implications that had. And recently, I've been thinking more about sort of the underlying narrative of finance as a primarily, if not purely, private enterprise, where private market actors, private investors, private lenders make decisions about how to allocate capital, credit, where that money goes and what that money finances. And the public is kind of relegated to that um, backbench, uh, sort of spectator role, right? Or when the crisis hits, we become suddenly the janitor, right? We come in and we sweep up all the dust right. and all the dirt, right? But we never are allowed to sit at the table when the decisions are made up front with respect to where the money should go. And so this, in my view, is the core of many, many problems in today's finance and the real economy. And uh, today's crisis, the COVID crisis that we're going through, actually is bringing those structural imbalances and problems right to the fore. And so that's why right now I'm refocused again on this idea for a new type of an institution, the National Investment Authority, that would actually try to correct some of these imbalances from within the market. So so let's let's sort of take a step back here. So the idea of a financial market, and, and this is a crisis that we're undergoing right now with financial implications, though it's not chiefly a financial crisis, right? So um, it, it's, I think it's important to make the distinction between now and 2008. Mm -hmm. 2008 was a financial crisis. It, it had all the features of financial crises that we've seen um, if, you know, through, throughout the years, if you ever read the, the, as I'm sure you have and any of the listeners, manias, panics and crashes and the, the sort of, um, and Keynes and the kind of canonical work on these, on these financial crises, which happened, have happened throughout history. We've got records of like Babylonian financial crises and yeah. like these, these things happen all the time. So that's, that was a sort of very classic financial crisis. Um, this obviously is a pandemic, which has created huge blows to the real economy, which have then reverberated into the, into the financial markets and in, into credit markets, worryingly, which are now being sort of very proactively stabilized by the Fed, which is kind of where things stand now. But the point you're making about the way that financial markets function, I want to just dive into it in a moment. So the, the the kind of textbook free marketeer vision of this 
is that the way a financial capital markets work uh, is that they channel savings to investment. So uh, people save money and then they put it into the financial system to save. And then the a, a well-functioning financial system takes that money, that that marginal dollar that you've put away, that you've you've and it channels it to an investment that has some promising return. And it, it should be doing that efficiently. Right. I mean, is that is that a fair characterization of the kind of like simplest but most rosy vision of what a financial market does? Yes, it is. It certainly is a fair characterization of the uh, orthodox kind of uh, uh, misconceived notion of the fin- of what the financial market does. Why is that not a descriptively accurate portrayal of what actually happens, particularly in U.S. financial markets? So, um, it, it, Chris, this is sort of a simple question. Um, but it's also a very complex question. So the way I like to describe it to my students, for example, is by uh, using an analogy, right? Uh, if you, for the first time in your life, went to a theater, for example, right, and watched a play, a Shakespearean play, and then somebody asked you, please describe me what a theater is. And you would say, well, a theater is when there are beautiful people, men, women, beautifully dressed, they come out, they talk to one another in this beautiful language, they fall in love, then one of them dies, and then everybody sings. And then I would ask you, is that a fair description of what the theater is? So what would you tell me? You would tell me, well, on some level it is, right? Because that's what you see. But what you're not describing is what really makes this happen, you know, in front of the stage. What's, what's, uh, what's left out of that narrative is that there is a playwright, uh, who's written the play. There is a director. There are all these people behind the scenes who make costumes, who make the play appear what it is. You're just describing what you see on the surface. So the orthodox uh, theory of how financial markets work, that it's essentially private savers, surplus units, those, uh, you know, nice kind of um, frugal people like you and I, who sock away the hardened dollars, they come right. to play in the financial markets. And then we essentially lend our dollars to somebody else, some entrepreneur with a great idea, right? And, and banks and investment banks and investment funds, they're all quote unquote intermediaries that stand between us and make this happen. And yeah, therefore, they're just, like, they're just the, they're just the, they're just the bus that, that picks up the money in one place and drops it off somewhere else, right? Like that's the sort of standard theory. Like I'm the frugal saver. You're the entrepreneur with a great idea and a, and a bank or any sort of financial intermediary. All they do is they, they, they pick up my money and they bring it over to you, right? That's exactly right. But, uh, the way they do it, the story goes further is unique and extremely important, which makes them extremely important for all of us to maintain and not ever to allow them to fail, right? They're special because without them, we won't be able to pay, make payments to one another. Without them, we won't be able to finance any kind of economic enterprise. Basically, a modern economy would come to a standstill. And um, the reality of it, however, is that, you know, it's sort of very easy to dispel it if you actually think about the mechanics of how banks operate. So, for example, um, when when you come to a bank and you ask them for a loan, right, according to this uh, financial intermediation theory, that orthodox picture that you just described to us, the bank, what the bank should do is first it should look into its own coffers and see, oh, do I have enough deposits that Chris and Sally and, you know, so on and so forth, people brought in. If I don't have enough money already deposited, then I shouldn't be able to extend this loan, right? But that's not what banks do. What banks do is they look at your ability to repay. They right. look at how credit worthy you are, right? They look at how good of an investment it is to give you a loan. And if you are a good investment, then they're going to go ahead and they're going to open up a deposit account for you and credit the entire amount of the loan to your account. And so they don't even have to worry about having enough deposits that are pre-accumulated, somebody already earned them and brought it to them. So how come they're allowed to do that? How come they're able to do that? Because they're members of a very privileged club. And that club is the commercial banking club because they all have access to the Federal Reserve's uh, balance sheet. In other words, they have their own bank behind them, and that bank is the Federal Reserve. 
And so each bank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Little Tompkins uh, Trust Bank, where I bank here in Ithaca, for example, they have ultimately a reserve account at the Fed. And so when they actually extend these kinds of loans and create these deposits to all various uh, borrowers, right? What they're doing is they're creating their own liabilities. Technically, they're private liabilities of these banks to pay on site. Whenever you want to withdraw money from your deposits, they have to produce the money. But that money is actually a liability of the central bank, of the Federal Reserve. It's not their liability. So because they have that access to that special account, the Federal Reserve is essentially pre-commits to whatever it is that they promise to us by way of our deposits. The Fed will honor on its books. And that's where the public comes in because the Fed is federal government. It's a representative of all of us, of the sovereign public, right? And it's basically standing behind all of these private banks that extend loans, create money, extend deposits, right? And it's the power of the Fed that uh, allows this to happen. So let me, let me, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to play student here and, and say back to you what you said here as, as, as my attempt to kind of synthesize it. So sort of the picture here, right, is that um, the orthodox, the orthodox story about financial markets and banks Mm -hmm. wants to hive it off from the public and from government and talk about it purely in these market terms Mm -hmm. about the supply of capital, the demand for capital and the price of capital, which is, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, ends up being interest rates. And your point is, it is impossible as just a, as a factual, descriptive and definitional matter, actually, to hive off financial markets, what banks do, how they operate, what makes them profitable from the public backing, that the public banking of the central bank and the Federal Reserve is actually constitutive of the market. It's not some like other thing out there and you can analyze financial markets independent for it. Us, the sovereign public people of the United States who created the institution of the Federal Reserve, which stands behind all this, are inextricably bound up in the doings of finance in a way that can never be talked about purely in market terms. That is absolutely correct. And you put it actually much better than even I did, right? No. It's, it, it, it's, it's true. That's exactly right. In other words, uh, the fundamental pernicious mistake in the orthodox picture is to pretend that the public is an outsider to the financial right. system, but right. also to the economic system in general, that the realm of the public is pure politics, you know, fighting about whose interests prevail and so on and so forth. But when it comes to money, economic resources, allocating those economic resources, they're absolutely, the public absolutely has no role in it. But in reality, Without the public backing, we wouldn't have money, we wouldn't have credit, we wouldn't have the economy that we have today. And the banks cannot survive without the central bank behind them because we've had that experiment before 1913 and it did not end well. We had essentially panics uh, every, what, four to seven years. Uh, you know, banknotes issued by one bank were not worth 100 cents on a dollar in a different area of the country. And that basically is a recipe for a complete disaster, right? So, but now that we have the Federal Reserve backing all of those privately issued bank liabilities, privately issued money, uh, now that we have all of this public infrastructure underpinning uh, not only banking markets, but also capital markets, because capital markets are intricately connected to the banking markets, right? Um, suddenly, it becomes much easier to pretend that, oh, you know, it's just kind of the Federal Reserve uh, and the federal government in general, they're just like an old parent, right? They don't know anything. It's like this sort of okay boomer kind of thing, right? What do you know <laughs> about the world? It's just your job is you just pay the rent for the house in which I live, right? And you just pay the bill, the credit card bill when it comes once once a month. Right. So and then we roll our eyes at you, right? Exactly. We roll our eyes at you saying, oh, you're so last century, you know, <laughs> we are the innovative kids here. But um, it's really funny because during the crisis, that's when that credit card bill comes and it's a whopping bill. Well, that's and that's the point. I think the reason that I wanted to have this conversation now in the midst, because we're we're talking about a thing that you could talk about distinct from COVID right now. But the reason I want to have this conversation now is that what we've seen now twice in 12 years, right, (laughs) is Mm -hmm. a very short period of time, two major crises that when the crisis hits, 
some notion that the the private markets just do their thing and the and the the Fed is this, uh you know just the it, it's just the table that dinner is served on that that just completely goes out the window because then all of a sudden the Fed's doing all sorts of crazy shit I never understand it frankly like I spent more than I would like to admit trying to understand everything the Fed did during the last crisis I reported on it. I went to Fed conferences I, and I half the time didn't understand what was going on. Right now, because I have a, you know several jobs, I, I can't devote myself to understanding everything the Fed's doing other than basically at the most basic terms, which is them saying, we'll backstop everything. Don't worry. But at the moments of crisis is when you see it all come to the forefront that these public policy choices made by this public institution are essentially life or death for the U.S. economy, for the global economy, for everything. It's like there's this one guy, Jerome Powell, most Americans couldn't pick him out of a lineup, and he's going to decide <laughs> along with the people on the board who Americans couldn't pick out of a lineup, basically like what lives, what dies, and whether we get through it. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Because in times of crisis, you know, what disappears is the trust is the trust in the right. credit and liabilities of various private institutions. So the fundamental entity in our economy, in our sovereign economy, that has the sort of the ultimate trust, the ability to really right. stand behind these promises, is us, the sovereign public. And the Federal Reserve represents us in that situation. Of course, everything basically comes down to the strongest balance sheet, and it's the Fed's balance sheet. And the problem is that, you know, the Fed is nevertheless a single institution which has a particular mandate, right? It has certain legal authority to do certain things. And its mandate is essentially, uh, you know, conduct monetary policy. It's sort of, it's there uh, to stand behind the strength of the U.S. dollar, to make sure that there is uh, plenty of money supply in the economy so that all product productive enterprise in the economy that, sh that can be happening actually can happen, right? right. But the Fed is not really meant for uh, direct lending, for example, to uh, a particular coffee house in Washington, D.C., <laughs> or, you know, a barbershop in Ithaca, New York. It's not their job. And now we're seeing that because it's a pandemic, it's not just a financial crisis, just like you previously noted. So it's not just about backing up liquidity of financial institutions. It's actually about keeping afloat real economy businesses throughout the country who are not able to function because the economy is essentially shut. People cannot come to work or buy their products. Because of that, the Fed is standing there now holding a much bigger bag than it was ever designed to hold. And so they tell us, we're going to do whatever it takes. And it's a great thing that that's, that that's what they're going to do because somebody's got to do it, right? Yes. We're, we're, I just want to stop you right there. I, I am... I think there's all sorts of critiques of what the Fed's done and what Powell has done in the details. But my general feeling about that part of it, that the that, that the, the Fed under Powell has gone quite aggressively and quite early to say that thing you said, we are we are embracing our role as the final and most trusted entity in the global finance. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, we got this. That that has been crucially important and the correct move. Is that would do you agree with that? I, I, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, because you know, in the moment of a panic uh, there is this sort of, uh, you know, uh, self-reinforcing spiraling, right? right, of fear and uh, sort of asset sales and uh, running away from transactions. And it, it can actually exacerbate the economic crisis much more than necessary. Right. And like you said, it's, it's a matter of life and death. So the fact that the Fed steps in and basically says that, don't worry, we got it. Uh, regardless of all these technical details, you know, oh, does it have the authority? What does the statute say? What does this section say? What does that section say? It's been, it's been a very good thing. But the problem with that is that, you know, once you're in that gray zone of whatever it takes, right, then how do you know that whatever it takes doesn't become uh, anything goes? Right? That, is, that is very well said. And particularly as I watch, like, I'm starting to watch the oil and gas conversation, exactly. you know, where it's like, okay, um, so we're, we're, we've got lots of crises. We're putting out a lot of fires. We're, we're, we're guaranteeing a lot of stuff. 
rightly. And now global oil markets are going haywire. A barrel of oil of West Texas crude has gone has has gone negative, uh, which is that people are paying you to take the oil off their hands because supply uh, because storage costs money, and this is causing all sorts of cratering. There's a sort of price battle happening between the Saudis and the Russians, and in the midst of a collapse of global demand, and so we've got this insane haywire global oil market. Uh, what if the oil companies and fossil fuel companies start to fail? Well, maybe the Fed or others can come and bail them out. And that's when I said, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I'm not quite sure I'm, I'm, I'm down with like the, the oil and gas bailout from the Fed. Oh, that's absolutely right. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, I'm glad you brought up the oil and gas issue because it's kind of a topic that that is uh, uh, near and dear to my heart, uh, not only because of my uh, a long time ago PhD dissertation, but also because um, I've uh, spent a lot of time researching the, the importance of keeping uh, big U.S. banks out of the physical oil and gas uh, activities. And part of what's happening here is that there are two ways, at least two ways that the Fed could, quote unquote, bail out oil and gas industry, right? One is uh, through this sort of direct expansion of its uh, direct lending facilities, um, essentially to allow, you know, um, uh, highly indebted and nearly uh, nearly bankrupt oil companies to borrow money from the Fed directly, but the other one. That, so that would be that they're not doing that right now, right? It's it is not the case that the current status quo is highly indebted, you know, nearly bankrupt oil companies. They don't have a, an account at the Fed where they can just borrow from the Fed directly, right? No, but but one of these uh, one of these programs, uh, um, uh, the the facilities, you know, the Main Street lending facilities, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, it's sort of it's not geared specifically toward oil and gas companies. But uh, the recent revision of that term sheet basically would enable a lot uh, of oil companies to borrow oh, through wow. that particular emergency facility and stay afloat. So, um, which is in itself, I, you, you brought up a very important uh, concept here because that's exactly part of whatever it takes strategy. Because under normal circumstances, no commercial company, oil, gas, or whatever it is, would be able to borrow directly from the Fed. Only banks were able to. But the Fed doesn't do that. That's what banks are for. The Fed backstops the banks. The banks are the ones that do all that stuff. That's exactly right. And the bank is also, uh, uh, the, the, the Fed is also probably going to allow, or at least, you know, I worry that it might allow big banks who lent money previously to oil companies that are now nearly bankrupt to essentially take over those companies' physical assets and operate them internally as part uh -huh. of their own enterprise, which is sort of Exactly the problem that uh, I've been concerned about since uh, 2012, at least, that, you know, U.S. financial institutions, banks that are publicly subsidized and are supposed to be purely in the business of banking and financial activities might now increase their presence in oil and gas production. And what does that mean from the political economy point of view? You know, uh, big banks are already very powerful players in uh, U.S. politics and the U.S. economy. And if in addition to their financial power, they... Uh, also become significant suppliers of oh, oil and yeah. gas and employers of workers in the oil right. and gas industry, that might actually prolong the life of an industry that uh, might not be uh, in the best of our interest to uh, keep around for a long time. Well, well that, that sort of brings us right to, the, to this, this question about what a more intentional version of this looks like, right? Because we're now, it's like, we're in the crisis. And you, that's a great phrase to say, whatever, you want to make sure that whatever it takes doesn't become anything goes, you know, that 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 hap a lot of that happened the last time around, whatever it takes, became anything goes, although, although I think that there's ways in which they didn't do whatever it takes, actually, <laughs> they should, they, they should have been more aggressive, the Fed should have been more aggressive. Um, but 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 making sure whatever it takes doesn't become anything goes in this in this very opaque universe of what the Fed's doing and who's accessing what facility and a tiny, tiny, tiny population of specialists such as yourself who are paying attention to that. Um, and then there's the, so there's that is the question, right? And the oil and gas is a great example. And then the broader question of like, okay, if it is always the case that the public and the sovereign public in the personhood of the Fed is in inextricably bound up with the functioning of capital markets that decide where investment goes, what would it look like to take that role more seriously as as something that we don't just do during a crisis? Um, 
So my view is that we should take it out of the Fed's hands. You know, we can't just overburden the Fed with every conceivable economic problem we have. These are structural problems that we're facing right now. We have a dying industry in a way. We have the industry whose uh, continuing existence actually may jeopardize the future of um, the planet, in effect, right? But because we're in the, in the moment of a crisis and we haven't done anything in terms of reorienting our U.S. economy toward more renewable energy away from the fossil fuel energy in the years preceding this crisis, now in the moment of a crisis, we're facing these very difficult choices, right? Do we let these companies uh, fail right now and effectively, uh, you know, let a lot of workers go uh, essentially without jobs, right? Or do we save this, the, these workers, but yeah. by saving them, we also save this completely inefficient and socially um, undesirable activities, right? This is the devil's bargain right now. And I have to it say, is. like, as someone who feels strongly about, extremely strong about the climate, like, I, the second part of that is not, not, it weighs extremely heavily. Like, the, this industry employs a lot of people. People are suffering the worst economic contraction since the Great Depression. There are, like... The idea that like, well, sorry, West Texas oil field workers, like you're you're shit out of luck. Like, I, I, it's, it's very hard to to be OK with that. It is very hard. And, you know, it uh, the, the solutions to to these kind of structural problems, unfortunately, cannot be fashioned overnight and solve all of the immediate problems right away. Right. So my view is that we need a new public institution. We need a different entity. We need an entity that is not the Fed and that is not the Treasury, just the two public institutions we currently have uh, uh, on, on whose uh, shoulders basically every problem falls during a crisis. But we need to create a permanent federal institution uh, that would be charged with the task of devising and implementing and financing a coherent strategy of sort of economic restructuring, making sure that our U.S. economy as a national enterprise, right, is structured in a way that actually has a future and that it we actually work toward making our economy more resilient, more resilient in the face of shocks, be it pandemics, be it climate change, be it whatever kind of shocks we experience, that we have uh, resources that we can mobilize and uh, reapportion in the way we need it, but more importantly, that we actually build it in a way that creates jobs that are sustainable, that are long-term, that are not some kind of temporary low-wage jobs, you know, you just shove people from one little place to another place, and that doesn't reward the kind of speculative uh, investment in, you know, some kind of um, some kind of financial instrument rather than investment in a sustainable long-term um, economic um, industries of the new age, new generation, right? We could have a, a, an entity, for example, that would basically be uh, not, not a central planner, that's not what I'm saying, right? But a hybrid, hybrid uh, actor. In other words, it's uh, it's a public entity that acts directly in financial markets and acts as a venture capitalist, as a private equity investor, as a lender, as a guarantor, as an insurer, to basically make it easier not only for the public capital, but for the private capital to flow into more sustainable industries rather than into the dying industries. And for that, we need to use the power of the federal government to take on the risks that private investors are not able to take on. So, so I want to, there's two things about that that caught, caught my ear. The first is that this question of resiliency. Um, w- one thing that's been very clear here is that, you know, in many, in many cases, there's an efficiency and resiliency trade-off, right? So a great example of this is supply chains. Um, you know, economies of scale are such that it's probably the most efficient to have like one enormous factory uh, in China making all of the, uh, you know, N95 masks <laughs> and shipping them. It's probably the cheapest and most efficient way to do it. But of course, that presents a resiliency problem, as we've seen. This is true of a million different things, right? You're, you're, there's a trade-off between efficiency and resiliency. And the market doesn't incentivize resiliency because there's no reason to have like five different small uh, N95 manufacturers that all make masks that are three times the cost of what the one big one in China makes, 
other than the fact that you might face a global pandemic and not want to be entirely reliant on the one big cheapest factory in China that makes N95 masks. So what I'm hearing from you is like one one goal here is to create a national investment authority some kind of public institution that's not the Fed that can kind of put its thumb on the scale towards these kinds of resiliency questions. Uh, is that is that right? Is that is that would that be one of the things it does? That's exactly right because you know um, I agree with you with respect to uh, uh, efficiency, frequently related to scale, right? And scale itself is not a big problem. Scale is good. But scale is not so good if that scale is uh, combined with purely private, concentrated private power. In other words, resiliency, uh, part of it is not just about sort of, uh, you know, b- having one big factory versus five small factories, right? It's about to what extent, uh, you know, that one big factory is controlled by one private monopolist. Because the underlying tension here is between the private profit motivation and the public interest and public need, especially in the moment of crisis, but also in, um, in normal times as well. So the National Investment Authority, uh, the way um, we see it, is um, supposed to be a kind of a uh, you know, a federal institution um, that is uh, the modern version of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which is uh, suddenly a very popular idea now in this COVID crisis. Um, uh, that used to be a really huge, it's like a capital bank for uh, the New Deal era, right? It used to be the largest investor in a variety of enterprises during the time when private capital dried out. So the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was created under the New Deal, yeah. And it was created by statute, right? And then it was like a kind yes. of capital lending facility for for projects. Is that what it did? So uh, it was a very interesting kind of a very flexible kind of an institution. It was created um, actually in 1932 by uh, Herbert Hoover. Oh, wow. And it existed for a year and it was uh, fashioned after the war finance corporation of World War I. Um, and for a year, it was basically just doing uh, this kind of lending and kind of guaranteeing and sort of securitizing uh, various loans, sort of the familiar kind of uh, supporting of the private activity. But then in, when Roosevelt came to power in March 1933, he basically changed the, uh, the leadership of RFC, put Jesse Jones, this Texas banker, uh, in charge. And RFC has become a really powerful, very sort of aggressive, in a good way, uh, investor in a, a variety of uh, a variety of industries. And it was not just doing the lending and securitizing and insurance. It actually took equity stakes in a lot of uh, banks and savings associations Hmm. and, um, uh, you know, agricultural cooperatives and even barber shops, small companies, big companies. It made injections of capital, huge injections of capital in a variety of uh, firms that needed it because there was no private capital flowing at the time. And it took uh, preferred stake, uh, preferred shares uh, in, in all of those, in all of those um, uh, entities and actually exercised quite a bit of control, uh, mm. if it wanted to over the direction of how business is conducted by those firms, right? And so, uh, within a year, uh, between 1933 and 34, the RFC has become, uh, the largest investor in private companies in the United States and its portfolio of investments wow. dwarfed the the entire portfolio of Wall, all Wall Street banks at the time. That's how big it was. And it's done so many things. It set up various subsidiaries. For example, uh, Fannie Mae was set up as one of the subsidiaries specifically to kind of uh, amplify the home uh, mortgage market, for instance. Um, and then, you know, it's done, it's done incredible, incredible work during World War II as well with respect to mobilizing various economic resources. In other words, it was kind of like sort of, if you will, a version of a black rock, uh, an asset manager in many mm. ways. And I think that's exactly what we need today. Today, what we need is a version of a black rock type asset manager a private equity slash venture capital firm. But that firm is not owned by private investors, rich people, uh, qualified institutional buyers, right? Not people like me or like you, for example. But that is owned by all of us, a public entity that does exactly that work and does it in partnership with 
private investors, pension funds, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, whoever they are. And that's what we need to recreate today. I want to talk about what that might look like and what the Mm -hmm. obstacles or criticisms of that might be right after we take this short break. All right. So, Sully, um, you, you, you talked about the, the Depression era, actually Herbert Hoover, Reconstruction Finance Corp, uh, and, and what that did and how it acted and, and the idea of a national investment authority today that would be somewhat similar, similar to big private firms like BlackRock that are private equity and venture capital uh, that, that, that manage a big asset of investments, um, but it would be public as opposed to, to private. What, what, what would it, let's say that you, um, you got a magic wand to make this happen or that you uh, were brought into an administration that had the votes uh, to actually create the thing, what would it look like? So um, the, the National Investment Authority would be um, probably best uh, organizationally patterned uh, after the Federal Reserve System that we have, right? Um, so there would be the National Investment Authority, NIA board, governing board, let's say seven to nine members uh, with a chair that is um, appointed by the president with the consent of the Senate, the usual thing. Uh, the terms would be staggered terms uh, for 10 to 12 years each, uh, removable by president only for good cause and so on and so forth. In other words, you create a, a non-trivial degree of independence for this particular board, right? And the mandate of that board would be to um, devise and implement a coherent national strategy of economic development, right? So economic growth, structurally uh, balanced uh, geographically and sectorally, and so on and so forth. But the NIA board itself would not actually make those allocative decisions with respect to where to put the money. It would operate through operating arms. And those operating arms would be set up not as government agencies, but as special federally chartered government corporations. Hmm. And why is that important? Uh, it's important because uh, government corporations are chartered by the federal government, by Congress, and uh, it's a very flexible organizational form. Basically, Congress can create a unique ch- charter for each federal government corporation that would specify its rights, its obligations, its mandate, you know, how it's overseen, how it's managed, and so on and so forth. And that's a very important tool for this kind of an actor. So, um, uh, at the very least, uh, I, I would say that, you know, there would be two operating arms, two subsidiary government corporations that the NIA board will oversee and regulate. Uh, one, um, let's call it National Infrastructure Bank. So that would be, uh, that's actually not a very novel idea to the extent no. that uh, National Infrastructure Bank proposals are abound. It's basically a form of uh, a government-sponsored enterprise type of a, uh, an entity, right? Uh, so it's basically going to, um, you know, uh, buy up loans uh, that, uh, let's say, you know, municipalities and states and uh, various public and private actors um, uh, issue to finance certain critical public infrastructure, roads, bridges, and so on and so forth. So the NIB, National Infrastructure Bank, would buy those bonds, securitize them, and essentially create secondary market in those bonds and amplify the ability to finance through credit those kinds of infrastructure products. Uh, But the second arm is what I personally feel particularly excited about. So uh, my um, my colleague, uh, uh, Cornell Professor Bob Hockett, uh, and I, we've originally written a paper about this uh, NIA project. We call it a, a National Capital Management Corporation, or NICIMAC. And we sort of um, specifically uh, try to mimic uh, the way private equity firms call themselves, because they frequently call themselves capital management something, something, right? <laughs> so the NICIMAC would actually be the asset manager, like a private equity firm, like a venture capital firm, like BlackRock, and it will operate that same way, not in that old kind of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac type of way, you know, uh, uh, issue bonds and basically securitize some some loans, but it would set up uh, a series of investment funds, kind of like private equity funds, right, and solicit private institutional investors' money uh, to be passive investors in each fund just like a general partner of any private equity fund would do. And uh, then uh, they would be, they would basically select um, uh, through, uh, you know, an auction process, for instance, uh, a set of public infrastructure projects to put in the portfolio that that fund would actually finance. Mm. 
And then the public manager, the NIA, the Nikki Mac asset management team, who would be professional finance uh, people, you know, that otherwise would go to Blackstone and Carlisle and right. other private equity firms, they would be hired by uh, the NIA and they would actually run those portfolios just like they would in the private world. So what I'm hearing from you when you talk about the sort of a degree of independence, staggered terms, fired only for cause, subsidiaries with um, uh, professional managers are seem to me all ways of um, attacking the obvious criticism here, right? The, the obvious criticism is that if you do something like this, you will create what will essentially be a cronyist undertaking, right? That that public public pressure and politics uh, capture rent seeking and cronyism will all seep into this. And we see this in all kinds of, you know, if you look at uh, the story of Petrobras, which is the, which is the, you know, the, the fossil fuel company that is the national fossil fuel company of Brazil owned by the Brazilian government, that these sorts of entities are very, very ripe for corruption. They're very ripe for, for favor trading. You get your allies on the board and then they, they start investing in your friend's projects or they start investing in uh, politically sensitive areas that you need for reelection and things like that. That. And before you know it, you've you've created this entity that it's ostensibly an entity about the public interest and the best investments, but is in fact wielded as a kind of tool of uh, cronyism and corruption. And so, what like, how do you think about that critique? And and and, st- and if were we to create something like this to stave that off? So. Um... That is, of course, the the biggest the biggest critique uh, we encounter. Right? Anytime you talk about something like the NIA, that's the biggest critique we encounter. Um, well, one answer to that is uh, in how the NIA will actually run its business. Uh, it's not going to be a standalone enterprise uh, like Petrobras, right? That's basically taking the money from uh, the federal government and investing it. It, it, the NIA, particularly the Nikki Mac, the asset manager arm, really will be uh, just a manager uh, of um, essentially public and private money put in a fund, right? And so if you think about it, what is it that it has to do to attract those pension funds and those insurance companies and those other institutional investors into that kind of a vehicle, right? There is a market discipline to it because you can't force private investors to invest right. in your fund. Right. So the private investors will actually be looking at how good you are at picking the projects that go into these portfolios, what it is that you promise them, and what it is that you deliver. And if you cannot deliver, they will simply not in, will not invest with you, right? Right, but then okay, but then then the, then you end up with the critique on the other side, which is the steps you take to make it as similar to private market investors by 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 them having a, a value proposition. How do you then retain some sort of social function, social role that may not be offering the best rate of return? Right, because it seems like what we're trying to do here is is combine these two things. Right, we want we want the sort of discipline of the market, so you don't end up with some yeah. cronyist bastion where people throw bad money at bad projects for political reasons. And at the same time, you don't want just some other market competitor that's going to chase the highest rate of return. If the highest rate of return is things like fracking or yeah. coal or bad industries, oh, what you want is lead socially. Absolutely. So in order to attract the private investors into, into this vehicle and sort of uh, minimize the danger of the incumbent politicians basically taking over and corrupting the NIA from the political side. What you need to do is you need to give private investors something of value, something that they will take from you and value enough to cede control over the process to the public manager. And uh, I think that the NIA is uh, in the best position to give them that, uh, that, that proposition because, you know, the NIA will be backed by the full faith and credit of right. the United States, right? And what the NIA could give private investors is a safe asset. Effectively, that's the safest right. asset in the market, right? It's, for example, the NIA could even guarantee the return, guarantee the return of the principal to those limited investors. No, no limited partners in the private equity fund are ever guaranteed the return of the principal. But right. if they invest in the NIA private equity fund, they may be guaranteed that, right? And then what the NIA would do is uh, they would say, look, we, the public manager, we will select the projects. And we will select the projects not on the basis of what is the most profitable in the next five years, in the next seven years, 
we are in a position to make that kind of a decision because private asset managers are not. Private asset managers are competing with one another and they have to deliver the highest returns in the shortest period of time, which is why they may invest money in the fracking project, but not in some kind of a long-term renewable energy project. But the U.S. government doesn't have that kind of pressure and its time horizons are much longer and it has many more resources. So what it can do is say, we're going to invest in this sort of longer term renewable energy projects. In in seven to 10 years, when it's time for us to wind up this fund and return the money to you, we guarantee you we will pay back 100% of your principal. And we will pay you back certain variable equity-like additional return. Now, the question is, where does that additional return come from, right? So private asset manager cannot just synthesize that return out of thin air because they actually have to make that money somewhere, yes. <laughs> which is why they go for the fastest, biggest buck without regard to the long-term consequences for the environment or for the people. But the U.S. government can actually synthesize that equity return by saying, for example, this, look, if this fund, if you help us to finance this kind of renewable energies, let's say the, the network of renewable energy plants throughout the entire United States, right? It right. may take 20 years to actually for, for that uh, network to start generating returns. But in the seven years, uh, the economists will make calculations that in, in, uh, upon completion, for example, this type of a project will increase, let's say, tax revenues of the federal government, or regional governments by, I don't know, let's say 5% or 3%. It would increase the productivity of the U.S. economy by 7%. It would generate budget savings by, let's say, 5% or whatnot. And so based on those projections, right now, seven years into the project, not 20 years into the project, we are willing to give you a right. proportion of right. that kind of a return, right? We will so, we will bring we will bring from the future into the present the expected net future value. Exactly. Exactly. And the other thing, the other wrinkle here is that the expected net net benefit, future net benefit, not to individual investors, but to us as a society. Right. What we will do, we will transform the public benefit into privately monetizable private benefit, and we bring it in time forward. You know, the, the interesting thing about this, I, I, I am very sold on this, and I think that if we are going to have anything like a Green New Deal or something like that, we're going to need we're going to need an institution like this. I think I think that's very, very clear. It's also the case, like these kinds of institutions have been used throughout history, uh, different kinds of ones, but even things like the Dutch East India Company, which was, um, you know, a, a, a privately chartered sort of government backed company. It was a private company, had sort of government backing. Uh, it did a lot of truly horrible things mm-hmm. uh, and engaged in, you know, uh, <laughs> mass violence and expropriation through colonialism. But as a but as a sort of hybrid entity, I mean, the, the my understanding is like the canal system was built in somewhat similar ways that it's not like this idea. It sounds kind of weird and technical, but the idea of essentially a private entity or a kind of private public entity that's chartered by the government for a purpose that it goes out into the market to do is actually a pretty old idea, right? I mean, we, we, there, there's lots of examples of this going back hundreds of years of governments doing this. That's absolutely right. In fact, the corporate charter, the, the very idea of a business corporation was effectively a special grant of sovereign prev- privilege by the king, by the sovereign, to a group of private actors, specifically for some kind of big public infrastructure project. Right, right. And that's how that's how it appeared. The, the origin of the corporation is literally this. This is this is actually the original purpose for which a corporation was constituted was a sovereign grant by the king for some public some public project. Essentially, Th- that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And only in the nineteenth century. Uh, have we gotten the modern version of this off-the-shelf corporate charter right. that, that now looks like it's a purely p- private creation. But even closer in history, uh, Alexander Hamilton, right, the famous architect of a lot of the American finance, his idea of what the federal government should do in terms of creating the, uh, a strong economy and a strong financial system was he had to, uh, he wanted to create the U.S. Treasury, which he did, um, and he created the first bank of the United States. And that first bank of the United States was in part a central bank, 
but it was also conceived in part as a development bank. Hmm. And it was a hybrid entity in that sense, because it was the private directors who were supposed to make decisions as to where to send the capital, which projects to finance. But the public directors had the right to withdraw the federal subscription if there was cronyism on the part of the private directors, for example. So uh, we, of course, you know, the, you, you know the history. First Bank of the United States was not renewed and so on and so forth. But ultimately, in 1913, we got the central bank back, right, out of that triad, Hamiltonian triad. So we have a treasury and we have the, the Federal Reserve, but we still don't have that development bank. And that's what the NIA would be. It would be a hybrid institution that would actually fill that void right now between purely fiscal policy and purely monetary policy and conduct that sort of developmental economic policy through hybrid means. Because we don't really need to finance everything from the federal budget. There is plenty of money right. sloshing around in the financial system. Like, for so example, much. It, there's too much. I mean, that, there's too much capital. I mean, this is the, the, the we are we are in the the great long disinflation and the and the and the sort of long era of 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 capital surfeit, um, which is the it's just the fact of the world and has been the fact of the world in the kind of neoliberal era for 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 decades. Well, that's exactly right. And all of these financial uh, financial um, institutions that manage investments that come, by the way, from our paychecks every every two weeks. Right. Part of my paycheck goes where into 401k. So some manager out there has to invest that money. I am a captive investor in capital markets and my entire future depends on how it's invested. But those those asset managers, they're looking at the menu of choices. Right. And they're competing with other asset managers. And their menu of choices are, you know, stocks, bonds, this and that, and, you know, various speculative investments. And, for example, private equity funds. Uh, apparently, in the last decade or so, for example, apparently public f- pension funds have been the largest investors uh, into p- private equity funds because they're looking for some way of creating, generating higher yield Return, so they yeah. can actually meet their um, their pension liabilities, right? So the NIA would create a new asset class. It would allow those pension funds to actually invest into something that would benefit all of us. And we can see where our pension money goes. It's a great, great point. Saule Omarova is a law professor at Cornell University. She specializes in financial sector regulation, um, finance, and the economy, and has a proposal for a national investment authority, as you heard her discuss. She served in the U.S. Department of Treasury from 2006 to 2007. Sally, that was, um, I I feared going into this conversation, it might be too technical, but but it was not, and it was really both enlightening and persuasive. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris. Once again, my great thanks to Professor Sala Omarova. Um, that was fascinating. I know uh, probably fairly technical for folks that are not sort of really mired in finance. I, I am not. I, I, there was a time in my life when I was, um, particularly after the crisis, I did a lot of reporting on it and and for my book, but I'm, I'm a little rusty. So uh, I appreciate that that may have been, um, uh, you know, one of those kind of hit back 15 second uh, conversations, which I, I personally like my, myself as a podcast consumer, but um, huge thanks uh, to Professor Omarova. That was really fascinating. As always, we'd love to hear your feedback. Tweet uh, the hashtag withpod. Email us at withpod at gmail.com. Why is this happening? Is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In Team and Kate Shaw, and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here, by going to NBCNews.com/slash Why Is This Happening.